Anthropological Theory, Chapter 31, Grief and a Headhunter's Rage. Renato Rosaldo, 1941. If you ask an older Ingot man of northern Luzon, Philippines, why he cuts off human heads, his answer is brief and one on which no anthropologist can readily elaborate. He says that rage born of grief impels him to kill his fellow human beings. He claims that he needs a place to carry his anger. <clears throat> the act of severing and tossing away the victim's head enables him, he says, to vent and he hopes throw away the anger of his bereavement. Although the anthropologist's job is to make culture, make other cultures intelligible, more questions fail to reveal any further explanation of this man's pithy statement. To him, grief, rage, and headhunting go together in a self-evident manner. Either you understand it or you don't. And in fact, for the longest time, I simply did not. In what follows, I want to talk about how to talk about the culture, cultural force of emotions. The emotional force of death, of a death, for example, derives less from an abstract brute fact than from a particular intimate relations permanent rupture. It refers to the kinds of feelings one experiences on learning, for example, that the child just run over by a car is one one's own and not a stranger's. Rather than speaking of death in general, one must consider the subject's position within a field of social relations in order to grasp one emotional experience. My effort to show the force of a simple statement taken literally goes against anthropology's classic norms, which prefer to explicate culture through the gradual thickening of symbolic webs of meaning. By and large, cultural analysts use not fear, but such terms as thick description, multivocality, polysemy, richness, and texture. The notion of force, among other things, opens to question the common anthropological assumption that the greatest human import resides in the densest forest of symbols and that analytical detail or cultural depth equals enhanced explanation of a culture or cultural elaboration. Do people always, in fact, describe most thickly what matters to them? The rage in in Ilingot grief. Let me pause a moment to introduce the Ilingots among whom my wife, Michelle Rosaldo, and I lived and conducted field research for 30 months, 1967 to 69, <clears throat> 1974. They number about 3,500 and reside in an upland area some 90 miles northeast of Manila, Philippines. They subsist by hunting deer and wild pig and by cultivating rain-fed gardens, swiddens with rice, sweet potatoes, manioc, and vegetables. Their bilateral kin relations are reckoned through men and women after marriage. Parents and their mar married daughters live in the same or adjacent households. The largest unit within this is the society's a largely territorial descent group called the Bertan becomes manifest primarily in the context of feuding. For themselves, their neighbors, and their ethnographers, headhunting stands out as the Ilingots' most silent cultural practice. When Ilingots told me, as they often did, how they rage in bereavement could impel men to headhunt, I brushed aside their one-line accounts as to, as to simple, thin, opaque, implausible, stereotypical, or otherwise unsatisfying. Probably I naively equated grief with sadness. Certainly no personal experience allowed me to imagine the powerful rage Lingots came, claimed to find bereavement. My own inability to conceive the force of anger in grief led me to seek out another level of analysis that could provide a deeper explanation for older men's desire to headhunt. 
Not until some 14 years later, first after first recording the tor- terse elongate statement about grief and a, a headhunter's rage, did I begin to grasp its overwhelming force. For years, I thought it more verbal elaboration, which was not forthcoming, or another analytical level, which remi- remained elusive, could better explain older men's motives for headhunting. Only after being repositioned through a devastation, a devastating loss of my own, could I better grasp the Yolongut older men mean precisely what they say when they describe the anger and bereavement as the source of their desire to cut off human heads. Taken at face value and granted its full weight, their statement reveals much about what compels these older men to headhunt. In my efforts to find a deeper explanation for headhunting, I explored exchange theory, perhaps because it had informed so many classic ethnographies. One day in 1974, I explained the anthropologist exchange model to an older Ilingot man named Insan. What did he think, I asked, of the idea that headhunting resulted from the way that one death the beheaded victims canceled another, the next of Ken. He looked puzzled, so I went on to say that the victim of a beheading was exchanged for the death of one's own Ken, thereby balancing the book, so to speak. Insan reflected a moment and replied that he imagined somebody could think such a thing, a safe bet since I just had, but that he had, he and other Alangats did not think any such thing, nor was there any indirect evidence for my exchange theory in ritual boast, song, or casual conversation. In retrospect, then, these efforts to impose exchange theory on one aspect of a long gut behavior appear feeble. Suppose I had discovered what I sought, although the notion of balancing the ledger does have a certain elegant coherence one wonders how much, how such bookish dogma could inspire any man to take another man's life at the risk of his own. My life experience had not as yet provided the means to imagine the rage that no that that can come from that come with devastating loss. Nor could I therefore fully appreciate the acute problem of meaning that Elongates faced in 1974. Shortly after Ferdinand Marcos declared martial law in 1972, rumors that firing squaws had become the prom- the new punishment for headhunting reached the Alongit Hills. The men therefore decided to call a mor- mortuarium on taking heads. In past epochs, when headhunting had become impossible, Alongats had allowed their rage to dissipate as best as it could in the course of everyday life. In 1974, they had another option. They began to consider conversion to evangelical Christianity as a means of coping with their grief. Accepting the new religion, people said, implied abandoning their old ways, including headhunting. It also made coping with bereavement less agonizing because they could believe that the deceased had departed for a better world. No longer did they have to confront the awful finality of death the force of the dilemma faced by the elongates eluded me to th- at that at the time even when i correctly recorded their statements about the grieving and the need to throw away their anger i simply did not grasp the weight of their words in 1974 for example while michelle rosaldo and i were living among the elongates a six-month-old baby died probably of pneumonia That afternoon, we visited the father and found him terribly stricken. He was sobbing and staring through glazed and bloodshot eyes at the cotton blanket covering his baby. The man suffered intensely, for this was the seventh child he had lost. Just a few years before, three of his children had died one after the other. In a matter of days at the time, the situation was murky as people present talked both about evangelical Christianity, the possible 
possible renunciation of taking heads and their grudges against lowlanders, the contemplation of headhunting for forays into surrounding valleys. Through subsequent days and weeks, the man's grief moved him in a way I had not anticipated. Shortly after the baby's death, the father converted to evangelical Christianity. Altogether too quick on the inference, I immediately concluded that the man believed that the new religion could somehow prevent further deaths in his family. When I spoke my mind to an elongate friend, he snapped at me saying that I had missed the point. What the man in fact sought in the new religion was not the denial of our inevitable deaths, but a means of coping with his grief. With the advent of the martial law, headhunting was out of the question as a means of venting his wrath and thereby lessening his grief. Were he to remain in his elongated way of life, the pain of his sorrow would, be, would simply be too much to bear. My description from 1980 now seems that so apt that I wonder how I could have written the, the words and nonetheless failed to appreciate the force of the grieving man's desire to vent his rage. Another representative anecdote makes me makes my failure to imagine the rage possible in a long bereavement all the more remarkable. On this occasion, Michelle Rosado Rosaldo and I urged by elongate friends to play the tape of headhunting celebration. We had witnessed some five years before. No sooner had we turned on the tape and heard the boast of a man who had died in the intervening years than did people abruptly tell us to shut off the recorder. Michelle Rosaldo reported on the tense conversation that ensued. As Inson braced himself to speak, the room again became almost uncannily electric. Backs straightened and my anger turned to nervousness and something more like fear. As I saw, I'm sorry, the Inson's eyes were red. Tukba, Rinaldo's elongate brother, then broke into what was brittle silence, saying he could make things clear. He told us that it hurt to listen to a headhunting celebration when people knew that there would never be another, as he put it. The song pulls at us, drags our hearts. It makes us think of our dead uncle. And again, it would be better if I had accepted God, but I still am an elongate at heart. And when I hear the song, my heart aches as it does when I must look upon unfinished bachelors whom I know that I will never lead to take ahead. Then Waget took Ba's wife, said with her eyes that all my questions gave her pain and told me, leave off me, leave off now, isn't that enough? Even I, a woman, cannot stand the way it feels inside my heart. From my present position, it is evident that the tape recording of the dead man's boast evoked powerful feelings of bereavement, particularly rage and the impulse of head to, to headhunt. At, this, at the time, I could only feel apprehensive and diffusely sense of the force of the emotions experienced by in, Insan Tukba, Waggett, and the other others presents present the dilemma for the alonga grew out of a set of cultural practices that when blocked were agonizing to live with the cessation of headhunting called for painful adjustments to other models other modes of coping with the rage they found in bereavement one could compare their dilemma <laughs> with the notion that the failure to perform rich rituals can create anxiety. The elongate case of cultural notion of that throwing away a human head also casts away the anger creates a problem of meaning when the headhunting ritual cannot be performed. Indeed, Max Weber's classic problem of meaning in the pro Protestant ethic and the spirit of the capitalism is precisely of this kind. On a logical plane, the Calvinist doctrine of predestination seems 
flawless. God has chosen to the elect, but his decision can never be known by mortals among those who, whose ultimate concern is salvation. The doctrine of predestination is as easy to grasp conceptually as it is impossible to endure in everyday life unless one can unless one happens to be a religious virtuoso. For Calvinists and the Elongates alike, the problem of meaning resides in practice, not theory. The dilemma for both groups involves the practical matter of how to live with one's belief rather than the logical puzzlement produced by abstruse doctrine. How I find the, how I found the rage in grief. Excuse me. One burden of this introduction concerns the claim that it took some 14 years for me to grasp the, what Alongitz told, had told me about grief, rage, and headhunting. During all those years, I was not yet in a position to comprehend the force of anger possible in bereavement, and now I am. Introducing myself into this account requires a certain hesitation, both because of the discipline's taboo and because of its increasingly frequent violation by essays laced with trendy amalg amalgams of contentual philosophy and autobiog autobiographical snippets. If classic ethnography's vice was the slippage from the ideal of detachment to actual indifference, that of present day reflexive reflexivity is the tendency for the self-absorbed Self to lose sight altogether of the culturally different other, dis despite the risks involved as the ethnographer, I must enter the discussion at this point to elucidate certain issues of method. The key concept in what follows is that of the, the positioned and repositioned subject in routine interpretive procedure. According to the methodology of the Herm hermeneutics hermeneutics one can say that ethnographers reposition themselves as they go about understanding other cultures ethnographers begin research with a t set of questions revise them throughout the course of inquiry and in the end emerge with different questions than they started with one's surprise that the answer to a question in other words requires one to revise the question until lessening surprises or diminishing returns indicate a stopping point. This interpretive approach has been most influentially articulated within anthropology by Clifford Geertz. Interpretive method usually rests on the axiom that gifted ethnographers learn their trade by preparing themselves as broadly as possible. To follow the meandering course of ethnographic inquiry, field workers require wide-ranging theoretical capacities and finely tuned sensibilities. After all, one cannot predict beforehand what one will encounter in the field. One influential anthropologist, Clyde Cluckholm, even went so far as to recommend a double initiation. First, the ordeal of psychoanalysis and then that of field work. All too often, however, this view is extended until certain prerequisites of field research appear to guarantee an authoritative ethnography, eclectic book knowledge, and a range of life experiences, along with edifying reading and self-awareness, supposedly vanquish the twin vices of ignorance and insensitivity. Although the doctrine of preparation knowledge and sensibility contains much to admire, one should work to undermine the false comfort that it can convey. At what point can people say that they have completed their learning or their life experience? The problem with taught taking this mode of preparing the ethnographer too much to heart is that it can lead a false air of security and authoritative, authoritative claim to certitude and finality that our analysis cannot have. All interpretations are provisional. They are made by positioned subjects who are 
prepared to know th certain things and not others, even when knowledgeable, sensitive, fluent in the language, and able to move easily in a, an alien cultural world, good ethnographers still have their limits, and their analysis are always good, always are incomplete. Thus I began to fathom the force of what Elongates had been telling me about their losses through my own loss and not through any systematic preparation for field research. My preparation for understanding serious loss began in 1970 with the death of my brother, shortly after his 27th birthday. By experiencing this ordeal with my mother and father, I gained a measure of insight into the trauma of a parent's losing a child. This insight informed my account partially described earlier of a long man's reaction reactions to the death of his seventh child. At the same time, my bereavement was so much less than that of my parents that I could not Im then imagine the overwhelming force of rage possible <clears throat> in such grief. My former position is probably similar to that of many in the discipline. One should reorganize, recognize that ethnographic knowledge tends to have strengths and limitations <clears throat> given by the relative youth of field workers who, for the most part, have not suffered serious losses and could not have, for example, no personal knowledge of how devastating the loss of a long-term partner can be for the survivor. In 1981, Michelle Rosaldo and I began field research among the Ifagios of northern Luzon, Philippines, on October 11th of that year. She was walking along a trail with two Ifago companions when she lost her footing and fell to her death some 65 feet down, a sheer precipice into, her swollen, into a swollen river below. Immediately on finding her body, I became enraged. How could she abandon me? How could she have been so stupid as to fall? I tried to cry. I sobbed but raged. Rage blocked the tears. Less than a month later, I described this moment in my journal. I felt like an, in a nightmare, the whole world around me expanding and contracting, visually and viscerally heaving. Going down, I find a group of men, maybe seven or eight, standing still, silent, and I have, and sob, but no tears. An earlier experience on the fourth anniversary of my brother's death had taught me to recognize heaving sobs without tears as a form of anger. This anger in a number of forms has swept over me on many occasions since then, lasting hours and even days at a time. Such feelings can be aroused by rituals, but more often they emerge from unexpected reminders, not unlike the Lingots' unnerving encounter with their dead uncle's voice on the tape recorder, Lest there be any misunderstanding, bereavement should not be reduced by anger to anger, neither for myself nor for anyone else. Powerful, visceral, emotional states swept over me. At times separately and at other times together, I experienced the deep cutting pain of sorrow, almost beyond endurance, the cadaverous cold of realizing the finality of death, the trembling beginning in my abdomen and spreading through my body. The mournful keen, keening that started without me, my willing and frequent tearful sobbing. My present purpose of revising earlier understandings of elongate head hunting and not a general view of bereavement thus focuses on anger rather than on other emotions and grief. Writings in English especially need to emphasize the rage and grief. Although grief therapists routinely encourage awareness of anger among the bereaved upper middle class Anglo-American culture tends to ignore the rage devastating losses can bring. Paradoxically, this culture's con conventional wisdom usually denies the anger and grief at the same time that therapists encourage members of the invisible community of the bereaved to talk in detail about how angry their losses make them feel. My brother's death in combination with 
what I learned about anger from the Alangas. For them, an emotional state more publicly celebrated than denied allowed me immediately to recognize the experience of rage. Along it, anger and my own overlap rather like two circles, partially overlaid and partially separate. They are not identical alongside striking similarities, significant differences in tone, cultural form, and human consequences distinguish the anger am animating our respective ways of grieving. My vivid fantasies, for example, about a life insurance agent who refused to recognize Michelle's death as a job related did not lead me to kill him, cut off his head and celebrate afterward. In so speaking, I am illustrating the discipline metho methodological caution against the reckless attribution of one's own categories and experiences to members of another culture. Such warnings against facile notions of universal human nature can, however, be carried too far and harden into the equally per pernicious doctrine that my own group aside, everything human is alien to me. One hopes to achieve a balance between re reorg recog I'm sorry, recognizing wide-ranging human differences and the modest truism that any two human groups must have certain things in common. Only a week before completing the initial draft of an earlier version of this introduction, I rediscovered my journal entry written some six weeks after Michelle's death, in which I made a vow to myself about how I would return to writing anthropology if I ever did so. By writing Grief and a Headhunter's Rage, my journal went on to reflect more broadly on death, rage, and headhunting by speaking of my wish for the elongate solution. They are much more in touch with reality than Christians, so I need a place to carry on, carry on my anger. And can we say a solution of the imagination is better than theirs? And can we condemn them when we napalm villages, napalm villages, is our rationale so much sounder than theirs? All this was written in despair and rage. Not until some 15 months after Michelle's death was I again able to begin writing anthropology, writing the initial version of Grief and a Headhunter's Rage. In the way one could imagine, rather than following after the complete, completed composition, the Cathar catharsis occurred beforehand. When the initial version of this introduction was most accurately actually beginning to write, I felt diffusely depressed and ill with a fever. Then one day an almost literal fog lifted and words began to flow. It seemed less as if I were doing the writing than that the words were writing themselves through me. My use of personal experience serves as a vehicle for making the quality and intensity of the rage and a lingot grief more readily accessible to readers than certain t more detached modes of composition. At the same time, by invo invoking personal experience as an analytical category, one risks easy dismissal. Unsympathetic readers could reduce this introduction to an act of mourning or a mere report on my discovery of the anger possible in bereavement. Frankly, this introduction is both and more an act of mourning, a personal report, and a critical analysis of anthropological method. It is simultaneous, it simultaneously encompasses a number of distinguishable processes, no one of which cancels out the others. Similarly, I argue in what follows that ritual in general and elongate headhunting in particular form uh, the intersection of multiple coexisting social processes aside from revising the ethnographic record the paramount claim made her made here concerns how many how my own mourning and conse consequent reflection on alungat bereavement rage and headhunting raise methodological issues of general concern in anthropology 
and the human sciences. Death and anthropology. Anthropology favors interpretations that equate analytical depth with cultural elaboration. Many studies focus on visibly bounded arenas where one can observe formal and re repetitive events such as ceremonies, rituals, and games. Similarly, studies of wordplay are more likely to focus on jokes as programmed monologues than on the less scripted, more free willing, improvised interchanges of witty banter. Most ethnographers prefer to study events that have definite locations in space with marked centers and outer edges. Temporarily, they have middles and endings. Historically, they appear to repeat identical structures by seemingly doing things today as they were done yesterday. Their qualities of fixed definition liberate such events from the untidiness of everyday life so that they can be read, like articles, books, or as we now say, texts. <laughs> Guided by their emphasis on self-contained entities, ethnographies written in accord with classic norms consider death under the rubric of ritual rather than bereavement. Indeed, the subtitles of even recent ethnographies on death make the emphasis on ritual explicit. William Douglas' death in Muralago Laga is subtitled Funerary Ritual in a Spanish Basque Village, Richard Huntington and Peter McCaff's Celebrations of Death is subtitled The Anthropology of Mortuary Ritual, Peter McCaff's A Borneo Journey into Death is subtitled A Barawan eschatology from its rituals. Ritual itself is defined by its formality and routine under such descriptions. It more nearly resembles a recipe, a fixed program, or a book of etiquette than an open-ended human process. Ethnographies that in this manner eliminate intense emotional emotions not only distort their descriptions but also remove potentially key variables from their explanations. When anthropologist William Douglas, for example, announces his <clears throat> project in death uh, in Mar Maralaga, he explains that his objective is to use death and funerary ritual, ritual as a heuristic device with which to approach the study of rural Basque society. In other words, the primary object of study is social structure, not death and certainly not bereavement. The author begins his analysis by saying, death is not always fortu fortitu fortuitous or unpredictable. He goes on to describe how an old woman ailing with the inf infirmities of her age welcomed her death. The description largely ignores the perception perspective of the most bereaved survivors and instead facilitates between those of the women, old women and a detached observer. Undeniably, certain people do li have, live a full life and suffer so greatly in their I'm sorry, decrepitude that they embrace the relief death can bring. Yet the problem with making an ethnographer's major case study fo focus on a very easy death. I use Simone de Beauvoir's title with irony as she did. Is not only its lack of representativeness, but also that it makes death in general appear as routine for the survivors, as this particular one apparently was the for the deceased, where the old woman woman's songs, sons and daughters untouched by her death. The case study shows less about how people cope with death than about how death can be made to appear routine, thereby fitting neatly into the author's view of funerary ritual as a mechanical program unfolding as prescribed acts to the Basques, says Douglas. Ritual is order and order is ritual. <laughs> Douglas captures only one extreme in the range 
of possible deaths, putting the accent on the routine aspects of ritual conven conveniently conceals the agony of such unexpected early deaths as parents losing a grown child or a mother dying in childbirth. Concealed in such descriptions are the agonies of the survivors who muddle through shifting, powerful emotional states. Although Douglas acknowledges the distinction between the bereaved members of the deceased domestic group and the more public ritualistic group, he writes his account primarily from the viewpoint of the latter. He masks the emotional force of bereavement by reducing funerary ritual to orderly routine. Surely human beings mourn both in ritual settings and in the informal settings of everyday life. Consider the evidence that willy-nilly spills over the edges in Godfrey Wilson's classic anthropological account of the conventions of burial among the Naikiusi of South Africa. So that some at least of those who attend a Naikioso burial are moved by grief it is easy to establish. I have heard people talking regretfully in, in, in ordinary conversation of a man's death. I have seen a man whose sister had just died walk over alone towards her grave and weep quietly by himself without any parade of grief. And I have heard of a man killing himself because of his grief for his, a dead son. Note that all of the instances Wilson witnessed or hears about happen outside the circumscribed sphere of formal ritual. People converse among themselves, walk alone and silently weep or more impulsively commit suicide. The work of grieving probably universally occurs both within obligatory ritual acts and in more everyday settings where people find themselves alone or with close kin. In Nyakuso burial ceremonies, powerful ceremonial states also become present in the ritual itself, which is more than a series of obligatory acts. Men say they dance the passions of their bereavement, which includes a complex mix of anger, fear, and grief. This war dance, Ukakina, Uka said in Old man is mourning. We are mourning the dead man. We dance because the, there is war in our hearts. A passion of grief and fear exasperates us. Iliaco, I cannot say that word. Elagio means a passion or grief, anger or feel. Ukasia means to annoy or exasperate beyond endurance. In explaining Ukasia, one man put it, like this, if a man continually insults me, then he exasperates me, Ukasia, so that I want to fight him. Death is a fearful and grievous event that exasperates those men nearly concerned and makes them want to fight. Descriptions of the dance and the subsequent quarrels, even killings, provide ample evidence of the emotional intensity involved. The articulate testimony by Wilson's informants makes it obvious that even the most intense sentiments can be studied by ethnographers. Despite such exceptions as Wilson, the general rule seems to be that one should tidy things up as much as possible by wiping away the tears and ignoring the tantrums. Most anthropological studies of death eliminate emotions by assuming the positions of the most detached observer. Such studies usually conflate the ritual process with the process of mourning, equate ritual with the obligatory and ignore the relation between ritual and everyday life. The bias that favors formal ritual rites, assuming the answers to question that most need to be asked, do rituals, for example, always reveal cultural depth? Most analysts who equate death with funerary ritual assume that rituals store encapsulate whim, encapsulated wisdom as if it were a microcosm of 
its encompassing cultural macrocosm. One recent study of death and mourning, for example, confidently begins by affiliating, or I'm sorry, affirming that ritual embody that collective wisdom of many cultures, yet this generalization surely requires case-by-case -case investigation against a broader range of alternative hypotheses. At the poor extremes, rituals either display cultural de depth or brim over the platitudes in the former case. Rituals indeed encapsulate a culture's wisdom. In the latter instance, they act as a catalyst that participates precipitate processes whose unfolding occurs over subsequent months or even years. Many rituals, of course, do both by combining a measure of wisdom with a comparable dose of platitudes. My own experience of bereavement and rituals fits the platitudes and catalyst model better than that of the microcosmic deep culture, even a careful analysis of the language and symbolic action during the two funerals for which I was a chief mourner would reveal pre precious little about the experience of bereavement. This statement, of course, should not lead anyone to derive a universal from somebody else's personal knowledge. Instead, it should encourage ethnographers to ask whether a ritual's wisdom is deep or conventional and whether its process is immediate or transformative or but a single step in a lengthy series of ritual and everyday events. In attempting to grasp the cultural force of rage and other powerful emotional states, both formal ritual and the informal practices of everyday life provide crucial insight. Thus, cultural descriptions should seek out force as well as thickness, and they should extend from well-defined rituals to myriad less circumscribed practices. Grief, rage, and elongate headhunting. When applied to a lingot headhunting, the view of ritual as storehouse as of collective wisdom aligns headhunting with experience expiatory sacrifice the raiders call the spirits of the potential victims bid their ritual farewells and seek favorable omens along the trail elongate men vividly recall the hunger and the deprivation they endure over the days and even weeks it takes to move cautiously toward the place where they set up an ambush and await for the first person who happens along once the raiders kill their victim, they toss away the head rather than keep it as a trophy. In tossing away the head, they claim by analogy to cast away their life burdens, including the rage in their grief. Before a raid, men describe their state of being by saying that the burdens of life have made them heavy and entangled like a tree with vines clinging to it. They say that a successfully completed raid makes them feel light of step and rudy in complexion. The collective energy of the celebration with its strong music and dance reportedly gives the participants a sense of well-being. The expiratory ritual process involves cleansing and cath catharsis. The analysis just sketched regards rituals as a timeless self-contained process without denying their, the insight in this approach. Its limits must be also be considered. Imagine, for example, exorcism rituals described as if they were complete in themselves rather than being linked with larger processes unfolding before and after the ritual period. Though what processes do, does the afflicted person recover or continue to be afflicted after the ritual? What are the social consequences of recovery or its absence? Failure to consider such questions diminishes the force of such aff afflictions and therapies for which the formal ritual is but a phase. Still other questions apply to differently positioned subjects, including the person afflicted the healer and the audience in all cases. The problem involves the 
delineation and pro of processes that occur before and after as well as during the ritual moment. Let us call the notion of a self-contained sphere of, a, of deep cultural activity, the microcosmic view and an alternative view ritual as a busy intersection. In the latter case, ritual appears as a place where a number of distinct social processes intersect. The crossroads simply provides a space for distinct trajectories to traverse rather than containing them in complete encapsulated form. From this per perspective, elongate headhunting stands at the influence of three analytical separable processes. The first process concerns whether or not it is an opportune time to raid historical and conditions, determine the possibilities of raiding, which range from frequent to likely to unlikely to impossible. These conditions include American colonial efforts at pacification, the Great Depression, World War II revolutionary movements and in the surrounding lowlands, fruiting among elongate groups, and the Declaration of Martial Law in 1972. Elongates use the analogy of hunting to speak of such historical vicissitudes, much as elongate huntsmen say they cannot know when game will cross their path or whether their arrows will strike the target. So certain historical forces that condition their Excuse me. My eyes just went blurred. Their path or whether their arrows will strike their targets. So certain historical forces that condition their existence remain beyond their control. My book, Along It Headhunting, 1883 to 1974, explores the impact of historical factors on Along It Headhunting. Second young men coming of age undergo a protected protracted period of personal turmoil during which they desire nothing so much as to take ahead during this troubled period. They seek a life partner and contemplate the traumatic dislocation of leaving their families of origin and entering their new wife's household as a stranger. Young men weep, sing, and burst out in anger because of their for fierce desire to take a head and wear the co coveted red hornbill earrings that adorn the ears men of men who already have, as along its say, arrived, volatile, envious, passionate, at least according to their own cultural stereotype, of the young unmarried man, Bunta, they constantly lust to take a, a head, Michelle and I began field work among the Alungits only a year after abandoning our unmarried youths. Hence, our ready empathy with youthful turbulence, her book on Alungit notions of self explores the passionate anger of young men as they come of age. Third, older men are differently positioned than their younger counterparts because they have already beheaded somebody. They can wear the red hornbill earrings so coveted by use. Their desire to headhunt grows less from chronic adolescent turmoil than from, from more intermittent acute agonies of loss. After the death of somebody to whom they are closely attached, older men often inflict on themselves vows of abstinence not to be lifted lifted until the day they participate in successful headhunting raid. These deaths can cover a range of instances from literal death, whether through natural causes or beheading to social death, where, for example, a man's wife runs off with another man. In all cases, the rage born of devastating loss animates the older men's desire to raid. This anger at ab abandonment is ir irreducible in that nothing at de a deeper level explains it. Certain, Although certain analysts argue against the dreaded last analyst, the linkage of grief, rage, and headhunting has no other known explanation. My earlier understandings of a longit headhunting missed the further 
Fuller is significance of how older men experience loss and rage. Older men prove critical in this context because they are they not the use set the processes of headhunting in motion. Their rage is intermittent, whereas that of youths is continuous in the equation of headhunting. Older men are the variable and younger men are the con constant. Culturally speaking, older men are endowed with knowledge and stamina that their juniors have not yet attained. Hence, they care for say say and lead bukar the younger men when they raid excuse me in a preliminary survey of the literature on headhunting i found that lifting of morning prohib prohibitions frequently occur after taking ahead the notion that youthful anger and older men's rage lead them to take heads is more plausible than such commonly reported explanations of headhunting as the need to acquire mystical soul stuff or personal names. Because the dis discipline correctly rejects stereotypes of the bloodthirsty savage, it must investigate how headhunters create an intense desire to decapitate their fellow humans. The human sciences must explore the cultural force of emotions with a view to delineation, delineating the passion that animate certain forms of human conduct. In summary, excuse me, the ethnographer <clears throat> as a positioned subject grasps certain human phenomena better than others he or she occupies a position of, or structural location and observes with particular angle of vision. Consider, for example, how age, gender, being an outsider and association with neo-colonial regime influence what the ethnographer learns. The notion of position also refers to how life experiences both enable and inhibit particular kinds of insight. In the case at hand, nothing in my own experience equipped me even to imagine the anger possible in bereavement until after Michelle Rosaldo's death in 1981. Only then was I in a position to grasp the force of what Alongitz had repeatedly told me about grief, rage, and headhunting. By the same token, so-called natives are also positioned subjects who have distinctive mix of insight and blindness. Consider the structural positions of older versus younger elongate men or the differing position of chief mourners versus those less involved during a funeral. My discussion of anthropological writings on death often achieved its effects simply by shifting from the position of those least involved to that of the chief mourners. Cultural depth does not always equal cultural elaboration. Think simply of the speaker who is filibustering. The language used can be sound, can sound elaborate as it heaps word on word, but surely it is not deep. Depth should be separated from the presence or absence of elaboration. By the same token, one-line explanations can be vac vacuous or pithy. The concept of force calls attention to an enduring intensity in human conduct that can occur with or without the dense elaboration conventionally associated with cultural depth. Although relatively without elaboration in speech, song, or ritual, the rage of older elongate men who have suffered devastating losses proves enormously consequential in that foremost among other things, it leads them to behead their fellow humans. Thus the notion of force involves both effect, effective intensity and significant consequence that unfold over a long period of time. Similarly, rituals do not always encapsulate deep cultural wisdom. At times they instead contain the wisdom of Polonius. <laughs> Although certain rituals both reflect and create ultimate values, others simply bring people together and deliver a set of platitudes that enables them to go on with their lives. Rituals serve as vehicles for processes that occur both before and after 
the period of their performance. Funeral rituals, for example, do not contain the, all the complex process, processes of bereavement. Ritual and bereavement should not be collapsed into one another because they nearly neither fully encapsulate nor fully explain one another. Instead, rituals are often but points along a number of longer processual trajectories, hence my image of ritual as a crossroads where distinct life processes intersect. The notion of ritual as a busy intersection anticipates the critical assessment of the concept of culture developed in the following chapters. In contrast with the classic views which posts cultural as a self-contained, a whole made up of coherent patterns, culture can arguably be conceived as a more porous array of intersections where distinct processes crisscross from within and beyond its borders. Such heterogeneous processes often derive from differences of age, gender, class, race, and sexual orientation. The book argues that a sea of sea change in cultural studies has eroded once dominant conceptions of truth and objectivity. The truth of objectivism, absolute, universal, and timely, timeless, has lost its monopoly status. It now com competes on me more nearly equal terms with the truths of case studies that are embedded in local contexts shaped by local interests and colored by local perceptions. The agenda for social analysis has shifted to include not only eternal veredities and law-like generalizations, but also political processes, social changes, and human differences, such as objectivity, neutrality, and oh, sorry, human differences. My, sorry, my eyes sometimes do that. Says terms in objective, uh, neutrality and impartially refer to subject positions once endowed with great institutional authority, but they are arguably neither more or nor less valid than those of more engaged yet equally perceptive knowledge social orders. Social analysis must now grapple with the realization that it's objects of analysis are also analyzing subjects who critically interrogate ethnographers, their writings, their ethics, and their politics. <laughs> Author's notes. See. In contrasting Morocco, Japanese forms of mysticism, Clifford Geertz found it necessary to distinguish the force of cultural patterning from its scope. He distinguishes the force from scope in this manner. By force, I mean the thoroughness with which a pattern is internalized in the personalities of the individuals who adopt it, its certain certain morality or marginality in their lives. By scope, on the other hand, I mean the range of social contexts within which religious considerations are regarded as having more or less direct relevance. In his works, Geertz developed the notion of scope more than that of force, unlike Geertz, who emphasizes the processes of internalizing within the individual personalities, my use of the term force stresses the concept of the position subject. Anthropologists have long studied vocabulary of emotion and other cultures. The vocabulary of emotion, a study of Javanese Socialization Processes, Psychiatry, for a recent review essay on anthropological writings on emotions, see Catherine Lutz and Jeffrey White, The Anthropolo Anthropology of Emotions, Annual Reviewing View of Anthropology, the two ethnographers on the Alungits are Michelle Rosaldo, Knowledge and Passion, along its notions of self and social life, and Ronaldo Rosaldo, and Alungit Headhunting and history, let me see. Our field research among the Alongates was financed by a National Science Foundation pre-doctoral fellowship, National Science Foundation research grants, and a Mellon Award for a junior faculty from Stanford University. A Fulbright grant financed a two-month stay in the Philippines during 1981. 
That's a hard one to get. I'm sorry. <laughs> Less the hypothesis in some rejected appear to utterly implausible, one should mention that at least one group does link a version of exchange theory to headhunting. Peter McCaff reports that among the Barawan of Borneo, death has a chain reaction quality to it. There is a considerable anxiety that unless something is done to break the chain, death will follow upon the death upon death. The logic of this now is now plain. The unquiet social soul kills and so creates a more unquiet souls. And then here's more of the readings. This is the end of uh, chapter 31. Thank you.